Hello, and my name is Lowell Vanderpool, and this channel is dedicated to IT professionals, IT students, and anyone who's interested in technical subjects. I got involved with a project that included data recovery from a two and a half inch spindle laptop drive and ended up in an upgrade of a Dell M6700 high-end workstation type laptop. We upgraded its disk system. We did thermal grease replacement on both the processor and the NVIDIA discrete video card and GPU. A complete cleaning of fans, heat pipes, and radiator systems. Put everything back together. Reloaded Windows 10. Flashed the BIOS to the latest version. Reloaded drivers. And used software to test the hardware subsystems. This project had lots of troubleshooting and problem solving. So I decided to record it, do a video on it, and share it on the channel. I'll be sharing the process step by step, giving you tips and tricks that I've learned doing this type of work for years. Let's start at the beginning. My son asked for some assistance in helping some friends who did video editing recover data from a user profile. There was a Seagate 2.5 spindle disk. It was possibly corrupted. So I began by using my USB disk toaster and popped in the, the Seagate drive and was able to see the drive and the data. Rule number one, back up all data before I did anything, before I went another step. So that was time consuming, but it was done. Now to back up the drive, I use RoboCopy because I really like it. It's fast. I use source destination forward slash B. The B is a known as a backup mode, which ignores NTFS permissions. So it allows you to back up even though you don't have rights to the files. So step one, change ownership. This takes time because of the amount of data. Step two, robocopy, source destination, multi-threaded, 50, retry, zero, wait, zero, and then the verbo switch. Now, multi-threaded is very important because it allows you to copy more than one file at a time. With an i5 processor, which I have in my desktop, more than 50 threads is probably a waste of time. There's a maximum of 128 threads, which unless you have a really, really, really beefy AMD, T is probably as high as you want to go. The recovery of the user's profile folders like desktop, documents, download was successful. Documents and spreadsheets and other critical files all seem to be fine. This seems smooth and sweet. So move the files to a flash drive and return to customer. In talking with a customer, it was decided to copy the entire profile to a spare hard drive, and the problems began. There were corrupted files in the user's profile under app data, local, and a new number of subdirectories. The profile was so large that I was struggling to find spare hard drive space to fit all the data, and copy operations failed continuously. The destination drive finally became unreadable. Oh boy. I wanted to determine how bad the Seagate 2.5 drive was, so I downloaded and tested it against Seagate's C tools. This is a great hard drive diagnostic tool for Seagate drives as well as other manufacturers. I ran the diagnostics and it showed that the drive had errors, but it seemed to be readable despite the corrupted files in the user's profile. I did not want to do anything more to the user's data drive, so I set that aside. My once healthy Western drive was unreadable now and would not even respond to Windows booting up on a boot disk and running disk part with a clean command. Since the drive was Western Digital, I downloaded Western Digital's lifeguard software. Again, always use the manufacturer software where possible. Western Digital's lifeguard saw errors on the disk using diagnostics. I erased the drive using the Western Digital lifeguard tool 
tools, repartitioned the disk, and I was back in business. Somehow the corrupted files copied to the disk had somehow forced some file system mess into the Western Digital. Beware, Tex. Now my Western Digital Drive is back, so I kind of licked my wounds and decided to try a different approach. PhotoRec is a software recovery program, data recovery program. It's probably one of the best there is. I've used it for years. It's not easy to use, but with some study of the documentation, I ran PhotoRec on the Seagate 2.5 and pushed the recovered files to the Western Digital. Had very good results. Now due to the size of the Seagate, which was a terabyte, it took all night to run. After looking at the Dell M6700 laptop and impressed with its i7 processor, 16 gigs of RAM, two hard disk slots, and a discrete GPU card, I shared that for a reasonable amount of money we could clean the laptop, replace thermal grease, add a RAID 0 SSD using two M.2 SATA drives. This upgrade is inexpensive and yields impressive results. I've done it on about 60 PCs laptops. I take super magnets like you see in this pack of 10 and I glue a chunk of toothbrush to one end so I can handle it. But I use it for stud finders or in this case to magnetize my screwdriver so it literally will pull a screw out of a deep socket. Here I'm removing the 2.5 inch Seagate hard drive. This is the primary hard drive. There's another slot for a secondary hard drive. Remember this hard drive? This is the one with the corrupted files. Here's the new RAID controller with SATA M.2s. To build the RAID controller, you're going to have to take the circuit board out of the enclosure. Be very careful. It's very fragile plastic, and you don't want to dam damage any of the components on the RAID controller board. You're going to have to put brass or stainless steel standoff to screw your M.2 hard drives into. Be sure not to over tighten any screws. They only have to be snug. Don't get crazy. Once the controller is back into the enclosure, then take a look at the documentation for the RAID controller. You have jumpers to set or switches to adjust. Read your documentation carefully when changing these micro switches. Remember, these are micro circuits. You can damage solder joints if you get in there and press too hard. StarTech is one of the few companies making these adapters using M.2s, especially for SATA. When you buy your M.2 SATA SSDs, be sure to get the right correct length on the M.2 drives. They come in various lengths and you want to make sure that you, you can fit your M.2 inside these adapters. Take care when you insert your SSD into the M.2 socket that you firmly and securely put that SSD contacts into that socket. You'll end up troubleshooting and pulling your hair out if you don't get those SSDs firmly into the M.2 socket. If you notice in the video, I'm not putting the RAID enclosure cover on the top. I'm leaving the SSDs open. I do that for air cooling. It improves the cooling of the solid state hard drives. And if you can get away with that and put that in your laptop, leave the adapter cover off. Leave the SSDs open to the air. It gives them more airflow, allows them to cool much more efficiently. 
Whenever doing a laptop teardown, always start with the maintenance manual of the manufacturer. Try to find it online, download it, look it over carefully. Try not to head to the first YouTube video because they're not going to talk about those things. So look at the safety, things that the engineers make you alert to concerning that laptop before you get started. The fan is the first time that I have to unplug a connector on the motherboard. These connectors on laptops are micro miniature. They're very fragile. They're designed well, but many of them have locking mechanisms. So it is important to study the manual to understand how to get them apart correctly. Here's where those guitar picks really come in play. A good magnifying glass, study the connector, then use your guitar pick to slowly and gently pry it apart. If you do not learn how to get those connectors apart carefully without damage, you're going to end up resoldering components or buying another motherboard. I'm not a fan of canned air to try to clean out laptops or electronic equipment. I much prefer a vacuum with a soft bristle brush. Remember, when you use a canned air, you can damage components. The velocity of that air is many times too high for some fragile components, as well as blowing dust and dirt and pollutants into the air. A vacuum with a soft bristle brush is probably the healthiest way of removing dirt and grime. Keep in mind, if you're in a dry, static, cold area, I would probably use a wrist strap if I'm using a vacuum. Most laptop keyboards are pretty straightforward to replace and remove. Make sure that when you put the flexible cable back into the connector that you seat it carefully. This is where I typically use a pair of tweezers to hold the flexible cable, insert it firmly, and then lock the connector in place. Here I'm removing the palm rest so that I can get to the heat sinks and do the thermal grease replacement. Lots of screws here. Very important to keep your screws organized, especially when screw sizes change. Keep those separate. The palm top cover is now being able to be removed. A lot of connectors had to be disconnected. Again, get that magnifying glass, the guitar picks very, very gently. Disconnect them. Pay attention to how the locking mechanisms work. Now the heat sinks are exposed and I can begin to disassemble the processor and video card heat sink. Here we're removing the heat sinks, the heat pipes, and the radiator fins that cool the CPU. Keep in mind that heat pipes have fluid in them that change state to help cool the processor or video card. They are sealed with solder and you can get micro pinholes in those solder and you can actually vapor out, vaporize out the, the cooling fluid. The only way to determine whether your heat sinks are working right or your heat pipes are working correctly is monitoring the temperature with software. Hardware monitor. You can see your main CPU temperature. You can also scroll down and see all of your packaging temperature. So let me scroll down here. Here we can see our temperatures on the package itself, the ceramic package that holds the core. You can look at the various cores and their temperatures. It is essential you know what your temperature should be and what they are when you're running them. So you can determine whether your heat sink is doing an effective job. Thermal grease on a processor or video card begins to deteriorate after about two years. If you're not taking your laptops apart and replacing the thermal grease within that period of time, they're becoming very, very ineffective and your CPUs are overheating and clocking down. You can see this thermal grease. I'm scraping it off. When you're replacing thermal grease, make sure that you get high quality thermal grease to replace it with. Don't buy cheap, inexpensive thermal grease. To remove your thermal grease, take a soft cloth, even a paper towel with some 90% isopropanol alcohol and it will clean the surfaces absolutely beautiful. In the picture below is my heat sink and I've got some yellow pads circled in red. Those are thermal pads that are glued or adhered to the, the processor's heat sink. They sit on top of the red square components on the motherboard and I've got them marked in red. That do not remove those pads because they help move heat from the regulators on the motherboard into the CPU's heat sink. 
So I finished the GPU's heat sink and you can see the thermal pads on this one also. This goes on voltage regulators and memory chips. When putting thermal grease on your CPU or your GPU, put a thin layer and make sure you cover the entire surface that needs to connect to the heat sink. When replacing your heat sinks back on to your CPUs and GPUs, make sure you use a diagonal pattern to tighten the bolts on the heat sink to the motherboard. I'm now replacing cables and you can see I've got my flashlight and my tweezers making sure those flexible cables go into the socket correctly and the locking mechanism goes down. If you don't do it right this time, you get to tear apart the laptop again. I prefer doing it one time. Finishing up cables, putting screws back in, verifying that everything is there, all the screws put in the right location, upgrading BIOS, switching the BIOS to a full UEFI mode, and then the fun began. Laptop powered up beautifully. Remember, this is the disk that's now in the hard drive slot. Booted up on my Windows 10 flash drive and started the install. It saw this hard drive, but it saw it as a two terabyte hard drive. This drive in a RAID configuration is about 463 gigs. No way is it two terabytes. Took the hard drive out of the laptop, put it back into my video editor in the toaster. It looked, the drive size was correct, 460 some gigabytes. It partitioned and files transferred flawlessly. There was nothing wrong with this disk. Some motherboard biases do not like these solid state hard drives in a RAID configuration like it, like is shown in the adapter. So I was beginning to get worried. But I began to think about this was the laptop that had the corrupted 2.5 Seagate. And after running many, many hours of data recovery on that 2.5, my gut instinct was that Seagate hard drive was fine. It did have corrupted files, but there was nothing wrong with that hard drive. I began to be concerned about the laptop controller. This particular laptop has two hard drive slots. It has a primary slot, which which is what I was using, and it had a secondary slot. So I put this RAID SSD into the secondary slot, booted up, Windows saw the disk and the proper size, loaded, installed perfectly. It was the controller on the primary hard drive. 